Let me share some words with you from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. In those days, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to the city of David called Bethlehem, because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged, and who was expecting a child. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, today we are finishing our look at the birth of Jesus through the eyes of Joseph. And over the last three weeks, we've learned about this humble carpenter who was chosen by God to be Christ's earthly father. We've learned that he was a righteous man, a man who chose to dishonor himself by having people believe that he had left a pregnant Mary before their wedding ceremony rather than have her honor compromised. He was asked by God to raise Jesus as though Christ were his own. And now we'll take a journey to Bethlehem and discover the final lessons that Joseph has to teach us. So to recap briefly the events of the last several weeks, Mary becomes pregnant by the Holy Spirit before her wedding to Joseph has been consummated. She tells Joseph that she is pregnant, and he decides to call off the engagement quietly. Then an angel appears to Joseph in a dream, telling him not to be afraid to take Mary as his wife, because the child that she will bear will save people from their sins. Now, in biblical times, if a woman was found to be pregnant by her fiancé prior to the consummation of the wedding, it was unlikely that the ceremony would have been delayed. In other words, she was pregnant, the wedding would happen immediately. Now, the gospel tells us that after Joseph was visited by the angel, that he did as the angel told him, told him to do and took Mary as his wife. But we really don't have a whole lot of other details. And the details that are included sometimes don't help us very much in trying to understand this story. So if we look at history and tradition at the time, traditionally a newly married couple would move in with the husband's parents, often in a new addition that was added to the groom's parents' home. Joseph lived in Bethlehem, so that's where they would have been living after the marriage ceremony. But the Gospel of Luke tells us that Joseph and Mary were in Nazareth when the census was ordered. That was Mary's hometown. We don't know how they got to Nazareth. They might have returned there for the wedding and been wed there. They might have went there after the marriage with Mary being pregnant. It would make sense that she might want her mom and her aunts and her family around her at the time. We kind of have to use our imagination as to how they ended up from Bethlehem back in Nazareth. We also don't know how they explained moving up the wedding. Scripture tells us that the only people who knew that Mary was pregnant was her cousin Elizabeth and her husband, Zachariah, and Joseph and Mary. They might not have told anyone else. In the first week of our sermon series, where Jesus returned to his hometown and people asked, isn't this Joseph's son? With the timing of the wedding, people just might have assumed that Joseph was the father of Mary's child. They might not have told anybody the story. They might have just let people continue to think that Jesus was their biological child. 
We don't know why Joseph and Mary stayed in Nazareth after the wedding ceremony. We just know that they did. A few weeks before Mary was to give birth, they had to travel from Nazareth to Bethlehem for this census ordered by Caesar Augustus. Now, several things were accomplished through a census at those times. First, everyone living in the empire was registered. So very much like our census that we have take place today. But the census also served another purpose. It also determined how much property people owned so that they could be taxed on it. Now, failure to appear for the census brought serious consequences for an ordinary person like Joseph. If you were a little higher on the socioeconomic ladder or you had a little more power, you might just get a slap on the wrist. If you were a common person like Joseph, failure to report for the census could, re could result in being imprisoned, having your, having your property taken away, you could have been beaten and scourged, or you could have even been put into slavery. Now, typically, only the man, only the husband had to appear for the census. So we don't know why Joseph decided to take a very pregnant Mary with him on this trip. There are a couple of different theories. One is that the census tended to foster rebellion within the Jewish community because it was a reminder that they were not their own nation. They were under the rule of the Romans. And so riots were common at that place. Some kind of upheaval and turmoil might have taken place. So that's one reason that he might not have wanted to leave Mary, that he feared that something would happen in Nazareth and he would not be there to protect her. He didn't want to risk something happening to her or to the child that she was carrying. But it might be a more reasonable reason that the possibility that Joseph's decision to bring Mary with him on this trip was at the prompting of God. 700 years before the birth of Jesus, the prophet Micah wrote these words. As for you, Bethlehem of Ephrathah, though you are the least significant of Judah's forces, one who is to be a ruler in Israel on my behalf will come out from you. His origin is from remote times, from ancient days. God intended for Jesus to be born in Bethlehem. Joseph wouldn't have known this, though. All he knew was that something was telling him that he needed to take Mary with him when he returned to Bethlehem to be registered. Perhaps you've had one of those nagging feelings, that little voice that tells you to do or not to do something, but don't necessarily understand why. Don't ignore those feelings when you have them. For they very well could be God speaking to you. If we pay attention and listen and act, we can find ourselves in the midst of something God is doing to accomplish his purposes in our lives. We call it God's providence. Now, Joseph and Mary, especially Mary, were probably not very happy that they had to travel for several days from Bethlehem right before Mary was supposed to give birth. But God works even through adverse circumstances. God took the decree of an emperor for a census, nudged Joseph into taking Mary with him to Bethlehem, which Joseph listened to and obeyed, and caused Christ's birth to take place there according to God's plan. So Joseph and Mary head out from Nazareth to Bethlehem. There are two routes that they could have taken. One would have been a longer route because it avoided the land of Samaria. Now most Israelites would have preferred this route 
since the relationship between Israel and the Samaritans were not good. The Samaritans were people that were left behind when the Israelites were carried into exile in Babylon. The Babylonians only took the desirable people, the pretty ones, the handsome ones, the ones who were smart, the ones who were tradesmen, the ones who could really contribute to the society. The rest were left behind. They intermarried with other tribes, which in the eyes of Israelites made them unclean. And so when Israel was allowed to turn back to the promised land, the Samaritans were considered unclean, and they didn't want to have anything to do with them. They certainly didn't want to go through their land. So they would add a couple of days to their journey to avoid having to go through Samaria. Samaria. The shorter route would have passed right through the Samaritan land, but it would have included traversing hills and mountains that divide the Holy Land in addition to traveling in hostile territory. So neither route was optimum. It probably wouldn't have been the best of trips under good circumstances, but especially not under these. This wasn't a pleasure trip. This wasn't a vacation. This wasn't a trip away to go see Joseph's family before Jesus was born. This was a trip that was forced upon them by this census, and it reminded them again that they were not their own people. That they were under the authority of the empire of Rome. Mary was very, very pregnant, which meant that she was very uncomfortable, and chances are very emotional as well. She had to say goodbye to all of her family, to all of the birth plans that she had made, to the support system that would have surrounded her upon the birth of her child. This was not something that they necessarily wanted to do, this journey. Oftentimes, we all find ourselves on journeys that we don't want to take. Sometimes, like with Joseph and Mary, the trip happens because of someone else's directions or someone else's actions. The journeys can be painful. We can find ourselves brokenhearted, and we can find ourselves discouraged along the way. And we might even think that God is punishing us or abandoning us. But God's promise to us is that God will sustain us, even when walking through the deepest, darkest valley. God tells us that if we turn our burdens over to Him, God will make something beautiful out of them. What unwanted journeys have you had to take in your life? Maybe it was the ending of a relationship. Maybe it was an illness or a move or a loss of a job. Maybe it was the death of someone you've loved. I've had several unwanted journeys as a newlywed of three months, Todd was offered a job in St. Cloud, Minnesota. And I was not happy about leaving my hometown. I look back now and say, why? But I was not happy about having to leave the place that had been my home for 23 years. In fact, I cried every step of the way, every mile to, to Minnesota. Tears fell. But that first unwanted journey was the first step of a much bigger journey that has allowed me to have some incredible experiences and develop relationships and friendships with people all over this country and in different countries, in France and Paris and England. And my life is richer for it. It was that first unwanted journey that has led me here to Central United Methodist, for better or for worse. God's providence 
has a way of bringing good and beautiful things from the pain and heartache and disappointments that we face in life. We've been looking at the Gospel of Matthew for most of this sermon series. Today I used the Gospel of Luke. Are you aware that nearly half of the Gospel of Luke is devoted to telling the story of Jesus' final journey to Jerusalem where he would be crucified? Where did he learn to take to walk the journeys that he did not want to take, trusting that God was with him. Maybe it was from hearing Joseph talk about the difficult journey that he and Mary took in faith and about what God brought forth from it. All of us go on journeys that we don't want to take. But in the midst of them, if we open ourselves to God we can see God leading us. And when you find yourself on an unplanned or a difficult journey, recall these words from the prophet Isaiah that Stacy read for us earlier. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even youths will faint and be weary, and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall walk, they shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Amen.